the uh, uh, the questions, uh, uh, you know, the real real time. You can ask a question yourself. If you want to use the the uh, the raising hand button, you have to go to participants, and then you can raise your hand. Uh, I will repeat it later. Um, but we will listen first to the presentation of Marijn. Marijn is uh, the global director of open innovation and circular economy uh, for food uh, at uh, Danone. Um, we had a test session uh, last week, uh, Marijn, and uh, uh, we took already more than one hour. And, and I would say, <laughs> I, pre I like it so much. So it's so nice to listen to you again um, uh, today. Um, um you describe yourself and that's uh, also i would say uh, proving your open mind you are a passionate uh, circular economy scholar and at the same time you are a system thinker an activist and an entrepreneur um somehow there are more people from different co different companies in this uh, in this uh, forum and the some more call themselves activists and I think that's what we really need in this time of transitions and moving from linear to circular. Um, at Danone he focuses on the intersection of innovation and impact and uh, Mirain's uh, mission is to be a driving force in the food revolution. Well we discuss many times impact but I think here we found someone with impact. Uh, Marijn, I would like to invite you to do your presentation and please the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. No pressure after that introduction. Um, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, as Ivo mentioned, um, I first and foremost actually consider myself a super economy um, for food. Yeah, Marijn, can I, can I just stop you for a second? We can see um, not the presentation, but the, the preparation for the presentation. Um, and uh, I think it's probably because you have uh, more desktop. Yep, more screens. Wrong screen. Now yep. you should be seeing the right screen. Otherwise, yep. you could just read and I can just have my coffee. Um, no, okay. thank you, Ivo. Um, um, indeed, as you mentioned, uh, I consider myself more of a, a scholar and an activist who happens to be working at Danone uh, and also be, be talking basically um, in, in that capacity today. I'll tap into to Danone's work and, and the examples that I have from work, uh, but I really believe that change is driven by individual passion. We'll talk more about that. Um, what I'll do is two things. First, we'll start off with a system level view um, with where I will explain what I mean with a circular economy of food and also why I believe that this requires a paradigm shift. Um, next, I'll take you through four key building blocks that can help us accelerate the transition towards and the adoption of a circular economy of food. Um, so let's jump in with the first. Let's see if this system works. Yes, perfect. So if we look at the current, um, that's one slide too far. Got it. If we look at the food system, which I would deem is a linear food system, it has delivered many, many uh, benefits. However, also many drawbacks. And I would say that this current pandemic actually painfully reveals those drawbacks. And if we look ahead, uh, at population growth, uh, rising middle class, and other macroeconomic projections, this will only exacerbate. Uh, just look at the staggering fact that you have on your screen in front of you. For every $2 of revenue generated in the food system, we as a society actually incur $2 in cost in externalities. And this is from a recent publication that I co-authored uh, with the Ella MacArthur Foundation. $1 actually is societal cost, uh, for instance, healthcare, and one dollar is an ecosystem to related cost. Uh, for instance, um, the depletion of soil. So even if we look just at this one simple number, I think we can all agree that the food system is ripe for disruption. Um, it is ripe for a food revolution. And I would argue that to obtain such a revolution, we need a paradigm shift. And now many people are talking about the new paradigm, a paradigm shift. It, it feels a little bit like the new buzzword, 
a little bit like the word ecosystem. I, I bet you that even during the day, you've probably heard this being called out a number of times. But I think that very few people realize how profound such a paradigm shift actually is. And also how, how deeply ingrained our current paradigm is in, uh, in our language, in our educational system, in everything we do. So therefore, I'd like to pause on this and kind of describe and contrast uh, the current paradigm and the new paradigm that I would advocate for when we move to a circular food system. So our current economic system is linear. It's a, it's a take, make, dispose model relying on a premise of infinite growth within a finite world. Um, I would argue that this linear system is grounded in a mechanistic paradigm. It's a paradigm in which we view the world as a machine, uh, one, a giant and intricate collection of cogs and wheels. Um, and one of the key drivers of uh, this required infinite growth in the system is actually efficiency, um, which I would define as doing more of the same with less. And this race for efficiency combined with this view of the world as a machine in which we seek to maximize individual elements of the system uh, creates a very fragile system, a system that is prone to shock. And again, I mean, just look at what's happening right now in this pandemic. And in favor of efficiency, all redundancies have been designed out of the system. Every element of the system has become specialized, skills are maximized, stocks are minimized, and feedback loops are being removed. Now, if we look in contrast to a circular economy, a circular economy is an adaptive and feedback rich restorative economy um, by design. So it's analogous to nonlinear living systems, which uh, I would describe as a complex adaptive system. Um, and the circular economy, therefore, in contrast, aims for equilibrium with a dynamic stability achieved through effectiveness. So doing the right thing rather than efficiency. Um, the circular economy is an open system. It's in constant relationship with its environment and it must adapt itself to that environment. And furthermore, in contrast again to what we have today, the circular economy optimizes the system as a whole rather than elements. Um, and it minimizes risks by managing finite stocks and renewable flow and as such, it works effectively at every scale and is resilient through its diversity, which again, reflecting on the time we live in now, resilience is one of those words that has come really to life as we live this pandemic. Now, overall, the circular economy is being adopted more and more widely. We see core concepts like benign chemistry uh, being applied to carpet tiles, uh, to desk chairs, we see light uh, jeans and even construction materials being sold as a service. But when it comes to the adoption of circular economy, food is actually lagging, which personally I find astonishing. I mean, something so existential, the, the, the one product that we actually ingest that literally gives us energy and life is lagging. And even more so, if I look at the examples that are being um, highlighted as quote unquote circular food, they are typically focused on redirecting or converting byproducts and waste streams into new products. Now, these are great steps forward and they're desperately needed, don't get me wrong, but are they truly circular? Do they really resolve the underlying systemic issue that we're facing? Or are we simply optimizing the current system? And potentially in doing so, are we perpetuating that same current system? Um, as Braungart and McDonough wrote it, doing less harm is ultimately no good. So that's why I propose that we shift to a new era, uh, a regenerative era, where, which is positive by design. And in this light, I would describe the circular economy of food as a food system with a positive social ecological and economic impact by design. And to jumpstart it, I, I propose that we focus on four things and I'll take you through each and every one of them. So the first thing is common language. If we look at um, the definitions today, 
there is no simple and comprehensive definition or set of principles for circular food. There's quite some literature and definitions out there, but they typically tend to focus on the technical nutrients of the circular economy. But when it comes to the biological nutrients in which we operate in food, there is very little out there. So today, if we ask 10 people, you basically get 10 answers. But as circularity is becoming more common practice and being adopted by the general public, common language is becoming even more critical. Um, it's essential to ensure that we can leverage on one hand side the innovation power of everyone, but at the same time that we also ensure that we do not lose the essence and impact of the concept of circular economy as it spreads, avoiding that it simply becomes just yet another buzzword for recycling 2.0. Secondly, we need to work on comprehensive and easily accessible metrics. Um, if we look at what we have today, we basically either have individual metrics or we have costly and time consuming LCAs. Um, but as the circular economy is grounded in complex adaptive system thinking, boundaries within it are arbitrary. In other words, if we're focusing only on one or maybe two indicators, let's take carbon dioxide and water consumption, we might be having with the best of intentions in the world, perverse and destructive effects on indicators that we haven't looked at, let's say biodiversity until recently, or in many cases, labor risks. So we need an easily accessible set of metrics that measures both the social and the ecological impact of our food products. And this is desperately needed because only once we have this, we can start to track progress. We can start to compare options in the C-suite or simply when we're in front of a shelf, choosing and voting for the world we want with our dollars or euros as consumers. And we can know where we're at on the journey. Thirdly, um, we need design principles. I'm one of the few people that has been focusing on circular economy of food and an R&D leader within a 30 billion euro food company. And I honestly feel inadequate. I feel inadequate because I'm unable to simply and clearly explain to our teams, that's 1700 product developers that come to work every day to create the food of the future, how to make it circular. And also in my capacity as Open Innovation Director, I interact with thousands and thousands of startups. And still, I cannot simply write a circular economy challenge, food challenge for them today. So the third priority is to define the circular design guide or, or design principles for, for food so that not everybody has to take a three, four or five year course to be able to actually harness their power and put it to use and start experimenting with the circular economy. Because again, if we agree that the circular economy of food is a complex adaptive system, one of the consequences is that it changes through emergence rather than in a planned fashion. Now, if it changes through emergence, then I would argue that innovation is its adaptive power, just in the way that procreation and therefore mutation is the adaptive power of mankind. So if we want to make sure that this, this dream actually becomes a reality, we need to optimize, maximize the amount of experimentation and innovation that we can get. And to do so, we need to harness the power of those thousands of uh, passionate startups, uh, product developers and big corporates, everybody in their garage that basically, or kitchen that wants to do food different. And finally, the fourth point is, we need iconic examples. If we look at the impact that the example of Schiphol Airport buying light as a service uh, from Philips has had on its industry and on some of the other iconic examples and the impact they had on their industry. And then if we look at the circular economy, which is, it, it's, it's complex. It talks about complex adaptive systems thinking. It talks about benign chemistry, technical biological nutrients, about it, it's basically selling a future of abundance in which our consumption might have a regenerative impact. That feels audacious. It feels dreamy. It might even feel spaced out. For sure, it is extremely complex and hard to grasp. However, once 
we have these iconic examples, it becomes tangible. And so therefore, therefore I would argue that one of the things that we need to actually um, catch up and make sure that the circular economy in food becomes a reality is we need concrete, tangible examples that embody the circular economy of food. And today I would argue there is no such thing on the market if we stick to the definition I just gave. So finishing up, in summary, the food system is broken. We've seen it, $1 for $2. We need a food revolution, and this revolution requires a paradigm shift, a shift from a mechanistic paradigm to complex adaptive system thinking, which is an analogous and, and grounded in natural living systems. To create this new food system, um, a food system with a positive social, ecological, and economic impact by design, we need to focus on four building blocks. We need to ensure common language. We need to define a set of principles to enable and empower the passionate. We need real-time and comprehensive metrics. And we need iconic examples to make this dream a tangible reality. And on that, I'll hold, come back on the screen, and I'm happy to continue the conversation. Marijn, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. This was uh, a very impressive uh, speech. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure how the other participants will experience this, but for me, this is this is a huge, huge, literally food for thought. This is um, uh, is really um, something was difficult to understand why things are as they are. And uh, I now understand also that you you have to be an activist as you are. Uh, without being activist, you won't survive yourself. Uh, yes. Because because then you, be, then you become a pessimist, I think. Um, yeah, a few it's, it's, it's very much what I experienced when I um, when I quote unquote discovered the circular economy when I started at Bradford. Yeah, um, the sustainability as we know it, which is the, the trying to do less harm, never sat well with me. I I, I realize very well that that the world as we built it can't continue as it is. Uh -huh. But I don't believe that mankind will thrive on being told uh, to take less showers, um, yeah. to stop going on vacation. Uh, it's all very restrictive. And what one of the things that I love in the circular economy is that it's a paradigm in which actually our, our um, actions, our consumption, quote unquote, can have this regenerative impact. Mm -hmm. And to your point, it's choosing to be an optimist rather than a pessimist. Yes, yeah, yeah of course. Thank you again. Uh, well, there are really uh, some people who are raised already their hand. Let's uh, do it one by one who did it the first or first in, first out. Uh, Fenna Blomsma, can I give the floor to you? Can you introduce yourself and uh, ask your question? Yeah, hi. Um, so my name is Fenna Blomsma. I'm a, a junior professor at Hamburg University. Um, I was just interested whether you could uh, Say a bit more about when you say circular economy and when you say food, are you talking about the packaging and, and transit waste? Are you talking about food waste? Are you talking about regenerative agriculture? That, that's one. Um, and also um, your principles are um, very inspiring. And uh, like Ivo said, definitely food for thought. I would be curious to to know how you are working within Danone to, um, yeah, to give them shape. All right, two questions in one, yeah. and both both really simple ones. So they'll be done in ten seconds. No way. Um, I'll, I'll I'll take a stab at it. The first one actually, um, actually, I mean, if we go back to complex adaptive systems, um, boundaries with for subsystems are arbitrary. And that answers your first question on when we talk food, are we talking um, packaging? Are we talking the, the edible part of the food? Ultimately, a product is, is totally circular if everything that it embodies, the full consumer proposition is circular. I, however, have chosen to focus on um, the food, the biological nutrients inside. 
not because I want to make this, this, this distinction between the two, but because what I was seeing is that there was a lot of attention for, for instance, plastic and packaging. Uh, when the EMF published the initial plastic report with the quote of 2050 having more plastics in the ocean than fish, it got a lot of traction and there's a lot being done. Now, I'm not saying we're there by any means. I think if I look at the plastics discussion, it's way too much still sitting in the uh, recycling 2.0 and considers plastic as only a potential technical nutrient and not enough looking at plastics actually as a potential biological nutrient, which would change the game. But I, I also at that same time looked at the, the, the landscape and saw that nothing was being done on food. Absolutely nothing. So I decided that I would focus on that first. Um, but it includes everything. Now to your point about waste, um, I believe that reducing the amount of waste we have in the food system, um, that redirecting uh, byproducts um, is essential. But I would argue that depending on how it's done, ultimately that is improved linear, not circular. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately what we're doing there is we're optimizing within the current system. Now, if we do that in a modular fashion and basically um, we take a nutrient approach, just like nature takes a nutrient approach, it's a different story. But what we tend to do as humans is we use chemistry to resolve our issues, complex chemistry, ideally. And the problem that we have is that by streams coming off of this complex chemistry in food, as much as in fragrances, as much as in flavorants, as much as in any chemistry, is that they are only there afterwards suitable for very few usages. So stitching together that pattern again and basically closing the loops on them is merely impossible. So what happens is we tend to use them for a relatively low use. And again, we tend to shift into um, just recycling or, or capturing energy. And that's why I deliberately move the focus to positive, socially, ecologically, and economically by design. I strongly believe that if we really want to catalyze a circular economy of food, we need to change the way we develop the food. We need to look at nature as a source of solutions rather than, sim than simply a source of raw materials. So that's question one, and it was more than 10 seconds. Um, what are we doing within the nun? Uh, fair question. So first of all, I mean, yes, I'm an activist. Uh, I can be an activist and still be employed and not fired by, by, by a big CPG, uh, thanks to the culture of our company and thanks to the culture of our CEO. Uh, Emmanuel Faber has clearly um, uh, shown and taken the stage um, and, and also stuck out his neck to show how he believes that the food system is broken and needs to change. And with doing that, he's empowering us as people within then on to also take action, to break the rules. Um, I've created this job. This job didn't exist. Um, I've created this job because I simply felt that it was needed and the company has allowed me to do so. Um, and then if we look at the four points, if I take the four points, in common language, we're working together with the Ella MacArthur Foundation to actually work on the, the principles and definitions. Um, when we look at metrics, we've actually developed together with a startup um, a, a tool that can give us the impact of our product at an ingredient level um, based on 300 different indicators of social and eco ecological impact in real time. And uh, it actually has, um, it has an, a machine learning element built into it. Um, so it is learning from every formula that we create and it will suggest optimizations. And we're developing this in a one-on-one -on -one relationship simply because I wanna get the MVP built. But our goal is to make this an industry initiative. So for instance, we've shared it with all the other members of the One Planet Businesses for Biodiversity Coalition which we launched at the UN Climate Week last year. Design principles is something that you'll see coming out of the Ella MacArthur Foundation as well towards the end of the year. We're working on that. Um, and the iconic examples. Um, we recently launched a um, accelerator um, a challenge actually with uh, Thought for Food and Google together. Uh, Thought for Food is a Swiss platform that has a tremendous reach into Gen Z entrepreneurs. And without much um, uh, without much press, 
we actually uh, managed within, I think we had three weeks before the, ch the, the challenge was launched. Within three weeks, we managed to get 3,000 startups to sign up and submit out of 175 countries. And they were predominantly over 90% Gen Zs. So we want to take that to the next level. We want to tap into other sources of well, but those are some of the things that we're doing. Thank you, uh, Mirain, for your uh, clear answers and also your openness. And uh, thank you, Fena, for your question. I would like to give uh, the next uh, floor to, uh, to Steve. And I see non-verbal that he almost cannot wait to ask your question. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Steve Kennedy, Associate Professor of Systems Thinking um, and uh, Sustainable Business at Rotterdam School of Management. Brian, fantastic to hear you talk about food systems as complex adaptive systems. That's music to my ears. Um, so two um, related questions, which you maybe couldn't combine in, in one answer. Um, you offer distributed experimentation as uh, a way to build the adaptive capacity of systems, which is fantastic. I was wondering if you could give another example of, of how you're trying to build the adaptive or transformative capacity of the system. And secondly, related to that is, how do you enable the self-organization properties of the system to, to dissolve the problems instead of actually um, solving the, the symptoms of those problems? Ooh. I, I would argue that if I can answer these both correctly, then I'm, I'm moving from uh, Utrecht to Rotterdam. I'm going to come and work with you. Please. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for that. And I don't know to what extent I'll be able to answer them, but I would actually love to also explore the answers uh, with you. Um, because one of the things for me is, um, I think system thinking is absolutely underdeveloped, I would say. Um, and uh, I'm a member of the, uh, the Google Food Lab, um, which is a think tank for the future of food. And uh, we've, been, we, we've been working on this a lot there. And we've seen that even it was, I believe, with Stanford graduates, um, uh, they did some experiments on a system thinking course and nobody, and, and, and nobody really, basically everybody failed. Um, so yeah, I feel that we need to develop two in one answer. I'll give it a shot. Um, on the distributed experimentation, one of the things that I think that we, we, need, to, we need to do is we need to um, rethink scale and flip our scale. The way we currently um, organize our company and the way we currently also uh, organize our, our entire uh, operational structure is we maximize the production element. Um, and we often decentralize the ideation and creation element. Uh, where I consider, and this is not the definition, but it's one of them that I like and I like to use, is I see innovation as a seemingly serendipitous collision of also seemingly unrelated ideas. Now, if you want to maximize the amounts of collision, what you need is you need to use ideas to flow as freely as possible. So for that, I would argue that you need to kind of flip an organization on its head and you need to, on the ideation part, be centralized and on the production part, be localized. The other thing that we're doing there is, um, it's, it's, it's also a cultural switch. So I would argue that one of the um, hurdles um, or blocking points for this emergent innovation is our mindset. Big companies, big CPG lives in a castle mindset so far. So very Games of Thrones like we lived in our castle and that castle had a big production facility. That castle had big marketing capabilities and we had our internal research and then we built a moat around our castle which was our IP and we were fighting the other castle. But again, Games of Thrones, what we didn't see was that winter was coming and that actually the world around us changed and the world around us is no longer a world of castles, but it's a, it's a, it's a nodal network. So we need to shift to becoming a point within that nodal network, but to do so, we need to change our culture because with that castle mindset comes a culture of not invented here, a culture that is very transactional. And if you 
want, again, ideas to flow freely, you need to move towards a reciprocal culture. You need to move away from uh, seeing the world and innovation as a zero-sum game. So I think those are two examples that I could mention. But love to follow up to find many more. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Steve. Thank you for your answer. Mireille, what are you doing? Uh, we have many questions. Uh, we have only 20 minutes, but so I'm afraid I'll we cancel will my next, meeting. Next, next event with you. <laughs> uh, Sigrun Wagner, uh, you asked something about the iconic uh, example. Did Mireille already uh, answer your question or do you mean something else with you? Can you? Yes, I was just wondering whether there were any as if, um, iconic examples in the making of consumer products that we might be able to buy in the supermarket soon. Painful answer is probably not. Um, so what we did through this challenge is um, we've had 3,000 people taking a stab at it. In the challenge, we also tested some of the building blocks, the other three building blocks that we had created. So we made um, the metrics available to those entrepreneurs. Uh, we made our first draft principles available to those entrepreneurs. So it served as a, as a catalyst for a, examples, but it also served as a feedback loop to us on um, our definitions, on our metrics, et cetera. Um, we're clearly not there yet, but mm, we will continue firstly to do this. So Thought for Food has actually decided that this will be a continuous track so Green Economy for Food will be a continuous track. Um, I have some other even bigger um, challenges that are in the works. Uh, I'll be pitching them tomorrow, so fingers crossed. Um, and then what we're looking at now is we're looking to actually take a few of the winners and, and the, the, the concepts that help a part of the solution and stitch them together into one comprehensive narrative. Because one of the things, if we look at the future of food, is that there are too few fairy tales out there or too few utopian stories about what the future might hold. And actually the stories we tell each other have a um, self-fulfilling um, kind of effect. And uh, it was a Rockefeller Foundation who looked at how many utopian and dystopian stories there are about the future of food. And they found two utopian, not 2%, two in absolute, uh, when we were developing the food systems, uh, food vision uh, 2050 project. So what we're trying to do is an absence of a complete circular food product and an icon. Can we stitch together that icon through basically storytelling video by highlighting the snippets bits and the pieces that actually really embody the circular economy through a number of examples. Uh, some that really take into account the um, social element, uh, some that really take into account uh, parts of the um, regen ag element, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the things that we're doing, but um, I'll, I'll work tirelessly to get that example ASAP. It's a very uh, surprising answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, I see that um, Alejandro Gallego Schmidt raised uh, his hand. Please, could you introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, sure. Question? Hi, hi, everybody. I'm Alejandro Gallego Schmidt. I'm a lecturer in circular economy and life cycle sustainability assessment at the University of Manchester. First of all, Congratulations for the great presentation, very inspiring. And actually my initial uh, question, you already answered it, it was more in the sense of if you have already started to implement some uh, circular economy indicators, so I'm gonna take the opportunity to change it a little bit. And I think I heard that you mentioned that the, the indicators that you are using now are or the, the main measure way of measuring is based in 300 indicators, if I heard well. Um, to what point can be that adapted to other companies that probably do not have the resources that Danone have to measure all these 
huge number of of indicators thank you for the question Alejandro. um that's i would say that's one of the reasons why i mentioned when i mentioned it that our intention here is to build it directly because i want to get something out there i want to get it done and one of the pushbacks i have on uh, a lot of of consortia um coming together is that there's so much debate uh before even building something that ultimately nothing comes out at the end and i very much took the lean startup approach of make something break it and build it up again um, indeed there are 300 metrics it's evolving i mean it will be 301 probably in a week or two it will be 302 the week after as as we've been building this over the past 16 or 18 months i think it started at 278 and we just surpassed the 300. for instance we added biodiversity through biodiversity international and that also comes to the question to, to the answer to your question which is um what we've been building is we've been working with this startup that builds up the database that aggregates the assessments and the knowledge that's out there and then labels it in a database and builds basically the API on top of it that links those individual uh, assessments to a cumulative assessment to your formula. Now, the great thing about that approach is that you have a network effect. So the more people start using it, the more powerful it becomes, which is why I want other companies to sign up. The other thing is, the more people start using it, the lower the cost of it. So it is actually very cost competitive and you don't have to build this on your own. And to that point, actually, I would argue that the problem of people building it on their own is that you then are gonna compete for the dominant way of calculating. And we wanted to move away from that. So the other thing that we did is, we're gonna use the tool for internal calculations first. We've not built a tool that we're going to use on pack or going to communicate to the consumer. Because the second we do that, we open ourselves up to having 1700 other voices basically questioning it. Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't have to, to happen. We have to build those standards. But I don't want to sit by and wait for those standards to act. An interesting example of why this came about was I was working with the same startup and we were working on elements. Um, and we were looking at almond production. And as you know, people have moved away from dairy products because of often, it's not generic, but often because of, for instance, animal welfare concerns. And then they moved into soy, but then they came about non-GMO. And were, oh, I don't want non-GMO. I don't want GMO. So let me go to almonds. And all of a sudden, almonds got the stigma of water. So I, now I need to move away from, from almonds. And then they went to pea, and pea has the stigma of biodiversity. I would argue what's next. When we dug into this, we figured out that the buyers, that the biggest almond buyers in North America that we interviewed together with uh, IDEO, none of them were aware that the water footprint of almonds is only there because of the fact that we graft peach trees to grow almonds. If you use native almond trees in Italy or Morocco, they are actually dry farm so their water footprint is relatively low but we've been building and we grow most of our almonds in the central valley of california and we've grown them on grafted peach trees which have shallow root systems which needs tons of water when i then went back to our procurement organization and said hey guys did you know this they're like no i didn't well, it only takes eight years to get an almond tree to full fruition. Oh, and that was the moment where I realized there must be thousands of things like this out there that the people that actually take the decision, which is the formulators on their bench, when they're first imagining that brief and trying to come up with the initial recipe that they simply don't know and they don't have access to. Uh, so that's very much why we built it in the way we built it. I hope that answers your question. You are opening a world for us. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks again for your question uh, and your answer. Um, I think now I would like to give Barbara 
uh, the floor to ask a question. Barbara, are you there? She had a question, but maybe I can ask him you later, but let's uh, go first to people who are, uh, who are present. Uh, Bosla, you had also a, a question. Uh, could I give the floor to you? Yes, thanks. Uh, I, I'm Bolesław Frock. I'm a sustainability management professor from Kosminski University in Warsaw. Uh, so I'm, I'm closely cooperating with sustainability director of Danone in Poland um, in our courses. But, but just the, the question more t terminological. You mentioned already regenerative <laughs> impact, regenerative value. What is in your perspective, what is the difference between regenerative and sustainable? If we are talking about sustainable value, and especially, you know, do you think that sustainable value creation could have a positive impact or a circular value? Uh, because you are just mixing all of the terms, and, and, I, and it's, it's just my question, what is your perception of the difference between regenerative and sustainable and positive, less bad or good enough, and so on? Thank you. So I'm scared to death to answer this question in front of this audience. Um, but I'm also super excited to get it because uh, I try not to mix them. I try to be extremely cautious in the language that I use. Um, I, I haven't used the word sustainable um, so far and deliberately uh, because my definition uh, or the way I see sustainability is as a, a paradigm that aims for zero negative impact. Um, and that's the, immediately the contrast that I see between circularity where the aim needs to be on, is on positive impact. Um, so uh, in other words, um, I, I kind of follow what Brown, and McDonough wrote in their paper on eco-effectiveness versus eco-efficiency. Um, now, when we get to, to uh, regenerative, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, do her justice, but um, some of you might know Carol, um, I presented about circular economy um, at the food lab and Carol was, as she's also a member of the lab in the room, um, I've never had such an interesting, but also such a, such a, a powerful discussion. Um, I don't think that I'm well versed enough in the regenerative paradigm to really pinpoint the distinction. I've had lots of discussions with Carol and her scholars, and I start to understand some of the distinctions that they make. But the way I interpret circular economy is very much in line with the way Carol interprets uh, regeneration. Um, now, I will never make the mistake again of calling it regenerative because I don't want to have her haunting me down. Um, but to me, those two are very close. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I really appreciate this answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Barbara Eagle, are you still there? I see your name. So her question is, um, adaptive complex system, where to start designing it? And she makes also remark, we are not naturally connected to all the experts who need to collaborate to create such a system, question mark. Ah, Barbara, here you are again. I ask your question. Thank you very much. I listen. Maybe, maybe you can give a big back, background about uh, your question to Marijn. Well, thank you so much. My, my background is simply we are very specialized in business school. I'm a professor in a business school. We all have our subjects and within management, we cannot solve this complex adaptive system. We also don't have necessarily engineering schools neighborhood. So what, how do we start? What, what, what skills do I need to acquire to be at least able to think it through so that I then can find perhaps experts and pull them in? That's my question. I think, uh, Barbara, you ask a question what all business schools should ask. 
<laughs> I, I would even say I think it's a question that we need to ask ourselves as a society. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. Because I recognize what you're talking about as a business school, but I would argue that this goes even much deeper than a business school. Um, if we look at um, oh, his name, just uh, I lost his name, but when a professor at Berkeley uh, on, ling on language uh, did an experiment where he asked, uh, I believe them to be six or eight years old, but young, young children um, to react to an arrow pointing upwards. And then he asked them to react to an arrow pointing downwards. And the word association with the arrow pointing upwards were predominantly positive. And the word associations with an arrow pointing downwards were predominantly negative. If we look at what we tell our children when they have garbage, uh, we tell them to throw it away. There is no such thing as a way in this finite world. So actually the, the, the mechanistic paradigm is so deeply ingrained in us because there's no innate reason why an arrow pointing upwards would be good and an arrow pointing downwards would be bad. So I would say this change needs to come all the way through our society, including education. You're completely right. Uh, one of the things that I very much appreciated uh, when I studied a circular economy at Bradford with, uh, with uh, Peter Hopkinson was the broad range of topics that was brought in. Um, it was, it was mind-boggling, but also extremely stimulating. Um, now, to your question of where do you start designing it, again, and, and uh, um, I would say Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Um, um, if we agree that complex adaptive systems change through emergence, so that every experiment basically can hit one of two things, a positive feedback loop or a negative feedback loop. And if it hits a positive feedback loop, it starts to grow in size and there so it can ultimately tip the scales of a system and start morphing the system, then you can start anywhere. Then it's really, and, and that I also think is the empowering thing because it's daunting on one end side to see this massive issue and think, what can I do in, about it? But then it's very empowering to think, but if it simply scales through experiments, I have the power to experiment. I have the power thinking about a business school in my business school to break the rules and to actually cross fertilize, to work with a business school that is far away from here, but we're all discovering how much can be done online. So it's almost a non-answer, but it would, I would say anywhere. Yeah, thank you, uh, Maren. I think also, Thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, just uh, also commented, and I think it's quite in line. Maybe would you like also to comment, Babak, about uh, where to start? I was agreeing that basically anywhere, wherever the problem has been visible and becomes an issue, I think um, you start from there and let it take us to wherever it takes us. Um, and we bring in whoever we need to bring in, uh, or we connect and align with whoever is. Uh, uh, you know, working on this, and therefore we we move forward um, in, in even in very small steps, uh, because you know, as they say very famously, you can't eat an elephant uh, other than one bite at a time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay, let us uh, uh, finalize this part of this uh, session. Uh, Marijn, again, uh, thank you so much for your presentation and your really very interesting uh, answers. We have uh, literally lots of fo food for thought and I'm sure this is the beginning of uh, many connections you will, you will have in this audience. Uh, but I feel also the, the urgency to, 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 to continue this conversation and to somehow to bring action. Uh, uh, and I would like also to thank our participants for uh, the questions, not only that you have the questions, but um, uh, the questions were really explorative. And this is the only way how we can create a really deep discussion. So um, uh, you, you asked, uh, you walked the talk, these were explorative, these were not ego questions, I so to say. No, I, uh, I, I thank you for all the participants. This was very energizing and i'd love to continue this for at least another hour so thank Perfect. you thank you thank you so much so it's now five one minute past five i think yes and we are slowly going to the conclusion which means we stay in this session but i will explain a bit what we will do next 
Uh, uh, Katharina, my colleague, you see here on the screen, uh, uh, rest left from me. Uh, she is making now small discussion groups of four or five people. Uh, so you will move very soon automatically in smaller groups. Um, this is also how we try to make uh, a virtual event um, not only dynamic, but also a little bit close that you can talk really one to one of a small group to each other. Um, um, so this is also for us a journey to learn, but we really think it will work. Uh, otherwise, we, we wouldn't do it. Um, uh, to share for you uh, your main conclusions of the day, your main thoughts, your main lessons learned, what you did today. Uh, four or five people, but you will find out yourself in which group you are. Um, you get, uh, uh, I think, 10 minutes, Katka, is that correct? You have 10 minutes to discuss together. Uh, you don't have to do anything because she will bring you automatically back in this room. In the bigger room where we are where you are now so don't do anything it will happen by yourself and take this also i would i would suggest also the opportunity not only to discuss but also to start your new network of people